All right. Thanks everyone for coming. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, my name is Matthew Borders. I'm the Fish Passage Manager for DPI Fisheries in New South Wales. Um, so one of the points that I want to get across today is, and it's already been discussed, is that we have barriers um, to fish migration. We have a lot. Just the weirs and dams, we got over 2,000 of them that are in our database. That's not including a lot of farm dams, so no doubt it would get up to that 10,000 figure that John was talking about. Some are high priorities, a lot are low priorities. Though. So because we have all those barriers and the impacts that have been talked about barriers, what that means for us is that why do I actually have a job? Why does the government actually care about this? Well, the reason is because we have legislation, Section 218 of the Fisheries Management Act. And the relevant sections is the, the first point, which says that an asset owner that um, constructs, alters, or modifies a, a dam, weir, or, or reservoir must, if the minister so requests, construct a suitable fishway. And I have suitable underlined because that's the actual wording in the legislation. It doesn't actually say what suitable is, but it says it has to be suitable. Another point is that if you actually build it, then it's your responsibility to maintain it and to repair it. So it's not something where you can just build it and, oh, I met the legislation, now I don't have to do anything more for it. Now, in the legislation, it says that if the minister requires, you must actually build it, uh, maintain it. And really, the intent of Section 218 was, first off, to um, limit any future impacts to fish migration, so any new structures. We don't have too many dams and weirs being constructed now. Most of them were built um, in the 70s and 80s and, and before that. One of the main intents was that for all those existing 2,000-some dams and weirs around the state, we want to eventually fix them up, fix up this passage as they come up for major refurbishment works. They weren't going to require all those owners all of a sudden to just put fishways in, but when they come up for major refurbishment, that's when we wanted to be able to get these fishways constructed. So that's the intent of the legislation. And that's why, in New South Wales at least, there's a big emphasis for asset owners to actually um, focus on fish passage and fishways. So in New South Wales, um, as I said, there's that suitable fishways. I've listed here the, the main suitable fishways. So rock ramps are the most um, common fishway that has been constructed in the state. In the technical fishways, the vertical slot is the next most common. Um, and then we have a few locks and a few denials. We have some other ones that Martin talked about, but only one or two of them, and they're not very common. And for most of them, we don't have the monitoring yet to show that they we know what the hydraulics are, but we don't have the monitoring to say that, yes, they're passing these species and, and these fish. And what I'd like to say to you is, all right, it says suitable fishways, and you as an engineer want to know, all right, well, what's suitable? What are the design requirements for that? The difficulty is in New South Wales, yet we don't actually have guidelines, engineering guidelines, to say the turbulence must be this, the head loss must be this. We, we know what it is, and when we're working with an asset owner, we give those across, but we don't actually have something in policy that actually says this is what it is. In Victoria, they do. They recently came out this past year. So if you want to find those, just type into Google Victorian Fish Passage Guidelines, and it'll come up with the Arthur Rowe Institute guidelines. But in New South Wales, we're working towards it. We just don't have it yet, unfortunately. Um, so as I said, we have rock ramps, um, vertical slots, locks, um, denials, and we have about 130 of them uh, fishways around the state that have been constructed, and I'm using the ones that have been constructed after 1985 because all the ones before that didn't work, and there's about 40 of them in New South Wales. So I'm going to first start off with the fact that fishways pass fish, and they can pass a lot of fish. In the Murray um, they have uh, 15 fishways on the main St. Murray River, and it's been shown through research and monitoring that they pass over a million medium and large-bodied fish each year. If we looked at the small-bodied fish as well, it would be vastly larger than that. Um, the reason I know that is because at, um, at, at the Murray Lock 8 vertical slot, um, they reduced the depths there, um, and they got over 80,000 um, fish getting through it within one day, and most of them were these small body fish moving up in mass here. 
We also know quite well that lock fishways work really well, especially at passing small body fish. At Houston on the Murray River, um, research there showed that pretty much daily um, during the two weeks that monitoring is occurring, they're getting 25,000 fish going through that fishway. Most of them, again, were these small body fish, but they are also getting some larger body fish as well. So that we know that they work. Um, this is a, a ping diagram. This is for a fishway on the Lachlan River. Um, the D1, um, so the D1 here represents an antenna at the entrance of the fishway. D3 represents the, uh, the exit, fishway, uh, um, exit of the fishway. There's an antenna also in the middle of the fishway. We put a tag in the fish similar to what you put in your cats and dogs, and we can monitor when they approach the fishway and how quickly they ascend up through. And what you can see from this ping diagram is just about every fish that came to the fishway entered and quickly ascended up. This was a vertical slot fishway. This is why we have confidence in knowing that vertical slot fishways work, because they pass, as long as the fish, as Martin was saying, enter into the fishway, then just about all of the fish actually pass through. This is one of my favorite ones, I call it the daily cod. This is one cod at that same fishway. And at 6 in the morning, it would ascend the fishway, and at 6 in the evening, it would descend the fishway. And it did that for about a month and a half period, over 40 times. Sometimes we've actually recorded, um, especially cod and these predators, staying within the fishway, and it's like a, a buffet line. They just sit there and the fish come to them and they can just eat them. But I found this really, really quite interesting. But again, it just shows how easy it is once the fish gets in, to be able to use these fishways. I'll just see if I can. Oh. Let me just see. Doing this backwards. Backward yes. work. I think I got your disease, right? Here we go. Um, started working. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> just see if we, this is just a rock ramp fishway. Um, and what it will show is a bunch of fish that are approaching. Here we go. Yep. Um, so a bunch of fish that are approaching it. These are juvenile mullet. Um, you're going to see uh, these are our smelt. This is the exit of the fishway. So they've made all their way up through. You can see how quickly they're zipping through. So we know again that these fishways are working. That's the only one that I have. We also know that if you're able to pass fish, it makes a huge difference to those fish populations. And so this is on the Penobscot River up in Maine. What they did on this site, on this river, is that they removed two lower dams, and at the third dam they put a vertical slot fishway on. Now, these are the years before they actually did the works. In 2012, they had 52 river herring approach that um, dam that had the vertical slot fishway on it. Since they removed those dams and put the fishway on it, they went from 52 uh, river, uh, river herring in 2012 to almost 1.4 million in 2017 and in last year, two, well, sorry, this year in 2018, they got 2.2 million adults returning. So this is a massive change. This is not accounting for the 50 to 100 million juveniles that are going back out into the ecosystem. These are just the adults that are returning. So we know that it can make a huge difference if you allow fish to get where they want to go. Now, the reason I started off my talk talking about the fact that we know that they work and that can make a big difference is because I'm going to spend the rest of my talk about what actually goes wrong with fishways. And as I said, they're, they're um, not something you can just build and, and just forget about. They actually take a lot of operation and maintenance in some cases to make sure that we achieve these wins that we know that we can get. So I'm just going to talk about, for various fishway designs, construction, operation, maintenance, and cost implications for them. So I'll start with the rock ramp fishways. So um, some of the advantages of them is that they work over the great operating range. They actually have one of the best, they have the best entrance of a fishway because the fish will just come up and um, uh, they'll be able to find it. Um, there are some limitations though. First off, 
they generally can um, only go uh, on weirs up to a height of about two meters. Um, they're uh, not as effective generally if they're on, say, a four meter high structure. In that case, you'd want to switch over to a vertical slot. Also, on a, a wide waterway, um, uh, you're going to have a, a large amount of rock that you're going to have to place in there, and that starts bumping up your cost as well. They're also very difficult um, for a full width rock ram fishway to build because you're building in the middle of a river, and river's dynamic and it's going to flood. and Contractors don't like that that because that's risk and, and that adds a bit of complexities to it. Um, and so they, they can be quite difficult in that, that perspective versus building something on the bank. And just to give you a perspective, this is a person here. So you can see that these are, are very large rocks that we're using. They're not small rocks. Um, maintenance and debris, I'll talk about those. But as Marin said, this is not something where you just dump rock and, oh, it's good, we're ready to go on. Now, the whole thing is a big jigsaw puzzle, and it takes a long time. So you're thinking a contractor trying to quote for this, and they need to work in stream. And they're going to be there for a while because they're placing every single rock individually because each rock needs to be pushing on the other rock, especially for these ridge rocks for which you get your head loss over. They need to be supporting these ridge rock, these pool rocks need to be supporting that ridge rock. And the contractor needs to go out and select these individual rocks so that he gets the right rocks to be able to get the right movement of water through the fishway. It's not easy to do. And he has to make sure, using these irregular shapes, that he gets these consistent head losses, 100 mils, over each one of these ridges. And that's really difficult because if you get one wrong, the only time that you're going to know is uh, right or wrong is after you've done building it and you let the water through. And if you get one wrong, it's kind of hard to fix because if you fix one, that has influences of what's happening at the ridge upstream of it. And so it, it's really a, a huge, huge complex jigsaw puzzle for the contractors. Another issue is that um, with that head loss consistency is that if you don't build it well enough, and as Martin was saying, is his there's some contractors that are out there that are really good, but if they don't build it well enough, those rocks move. And so at the top end of this fishway here, this rock ramp, those rocks move. And so you can't see any of those really consistent head losses, and most of those pools have vanished. And you can't just easily fix this. You pretty much have to rebuild that fishway. Here's another one where the rocks that were used were too small, and so they washed away along the sides here. But the other issue at this site which is very common at the rock ramp fishways, is that because you have these ridges that are sitting out of the water, and most of the time the flow is quite low, you get huge amounts of debris accumulation at the top. When we went out and we assessed, last year we assessed all the fishways around New South Wales, just about every single rock ramp fishway that we went to that had these high ridges was collecting debris, and I would spend a good part of 50, uh, a half an hour to an hour pulling out all the debris, because this is what it looks like afterwards. So that's how it's supposed to do, but a lot of these fishways are in rural settings. There's no one there manning it. There's no one there that's actively uh, maintaining it. And so, except for when someone comes along and, and pulls it out, or a high flow comes along that pushes that debris, instead what it does is it pushes the water flow um, in shallow water flow, which is hard for large fish to get past upstream. Another issue that Martin talked about is you try to build these fishways 300 mils below um, the downstream water level, but at this site we did that and then ma massive flood came and dropped the tailwater by a meter and all of a sudden our rock ramp, at, our, our toe is exposed. If that starts eroding away, the rest of the fishway will go. And so it's good to use sheet piling at the base there to really lock it in. And in the worst cases, you get complete failure where the bulk of the fishway just washes away, um, primarily using rock that isn't of suitable size. So with that going out and seeing those, what we now in, in fisheries, DPI fisheries, a design that we really like, and Myron showed an example of this, um, is a, a V-shaped prefab rock ramp fishway. So the V-shape, the reason that we like that is because you get this higher velocity down the midder, middle, which isn't great for fish. They'll be able to get up through the quiet zones on the side, but the debris generally washes down the middle. We don't get those debris accumulations 
that we noticed before. The other great thing is that we get really consistent head losses across these because they're the consistent shape. So we're not having to deal with the natural variation in rock. Also, in the construction side of it, um, it was quite easy to build. They were building one of these ridges. They're installing them about one, ri um, one row of ridges an hour and then having another hour to, ba to backfill it. And, and what they did is each one of these were, were big concrete um, ridges, individual. They would just use the excavator, place them in, and then there's this um, uh, steel uh, bar here, and they would bolt both of the ridges together. That would provide stability. The ridge, the top of that, that steel um, plate there was actually um, uh, surveyed to the exact point to be able to get the right head losses across the ridges. And then all they had to do was backfill it with large rock to be able to lock it in place. And two thirds of those um, ridges were buried. So there's a lot of stability in here. Very quick construction time reduces the risk for the contractor, which tends to drop your, lower your prices. Now this is the one that Martin was trying to get that video for. This is the Brie Warren Fishway that Heath was involved with. Again, this is the same thing. It's a V-shaped design. And it's a recessed partial width rock ramp, which is great because it's still the barrier for fish is right here and the entrance of the fishway is right here. But again, it has that V-shape so that you won't get really that debris accumulating over it. This was for cultural reasons. We had to use rock, but it took a year for the contractor to build this fishway because he had to cut and get specific rock to be able to fit it. That's why we want to go with those prefab because it's much easier. A similar um, design concept that, that really achieves the same thing are these prefabricated cone ridges. And you can have these, at, and they work at low flow, low flow channel, and then you get the high flow ridges. I would prefer to see these um, at low flow, these ridges a bit lower, because again, they're going to accumulate that debris um, at the top one or two ridges. So I'm going to go on to now to the vertical slot design and issues that we have there. Oh, great, great advantages to them. They're, on the technical side, they're generally for weirs between one to seven meters, the go-to design, generally. The issues with them is that they, they are generally built on a one in 20, one in 30 slope. That's pretty much fixed. You can't go um, steeper than that because then the turbulence and velocity criteria exceeds what the fish are able to swim up through. And so because of that, they have a really large footprint and generally they're made out of concrete, which means that they have a really high cost to them. Um, the asset owners, that becomes a bit of a barrier for them. But um, another thing, and debris is an issue for all types of fishways. For vertical slots, it's really critical. Here's a, a you put a trash screen on the top side of a vertical slot to try to um, stop the, the trash from getting in. Um, but when it accumulates this thick, it's hard for the fish to actually get through that. They can actually be so thick that nothing can get through. A simple fix of this, this one was designed so that it's, it's pointing directly straight upstream. So the, 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 the trash screen is, is, is a great vehicle to just catch everything that comes down. A way to fix that is just to have it so that the exit is actually coming um, so that the water is going across it. And so it'll sweep the debris off rather than pushing it up onto the screen. And the reason that we need to do that is because we have, these are the slots inside of a, a, a fishway, quite a narrow thing. They're great for debris to get caught on. Once debris gets caught in those slots, then the hydraulics change, and that affects the ability of fish to go through. Things like plastic bottles love to lodge themselves in those. So it's critical to stop the debris from getting into there. Another thing, and this was a, a really important point that Marin mentioned, is that you need to be able to get um, your entrances correct. But just because you're in, the entrance for the fishway is here and another one here, these are two different ones. These are, this is moderate flow. This isn't even a high discharge. This is the Darling River here. And you can see the turbulence here. And this is when the fish are gonna wanna be getting up through, but they're just not gonna be able to get up to that entrance. So we need to be able to work once they're built, minor modifications might need to be made where we play, maybe put a small nib wall here to push this water away so that the fish will be able to easily get into the fishway. This is quite uncommon. I don't want to make it out like all these fishways are, are failing. 
But this does happen. We have a handful of sites where we've identified it, and it's an easy fix once we've identified it. And that's why you want to do monitoring at the fisheries as well. This does a good job of showing you what I was talking about, getting those entrance conditions and the flows right. This is at a regulating structure, and this is where we are walk, uh, working with the asset owner to see how we could manage it. Here we put all the flows um, through, through one gate, and you can see the high, um, high turbines. The fish are going to accumulate here away from the fishway entrance. Here we um, split the flows between the, 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 the two gates, and so the fish are going to come up. You can see the flow coming out of the fishway entrance there, which is great. But we also have fish that are going to come over to this other side and camp over there. And so what you, really what you want to do is have the flow on this gate spread between these two and have, and have it so that the, the turbulence field is drawing fish over to that side. Um, this is a figure from Heath here um, of where we're trying we went through a period where we were making fishways um, a bit complex, having multiple entrances, multiple exits, and on that we were putting um, uh, automated gates or gates that had to be managed. And that was great because we were trying to achieve fish passage over 100% of flow conditions for all species. The problem is that we found is that you increase the complexity um, of the fishways in terms of putting this automated stuff on, maybe needing water level sensors, that complexity was causing them to oftentimes not operate correctly. So instead of operating over 100% of conditions, maybe they're only operating for 50% of the conditions. So we're now trying to go to more simpler designs. We're trying to take those automation moving components out of fish waste. And so he, and also working with Martin on this, <coughs> trying to design the baffles, different height baffles and different size slots is what Martin was saying to be able to achieve the outcome. We still have two entrances here. One's here and one's here at the, the base of the fishway. But by changing the baffles, they were able to get away with needing to put in gates at this structure, which meant that now all it is is a concrete channel and it should operate as long as debris doesn't clog it up. I'll just quickly go through lock fishways. Um, as Martin said, they, they should in theory work. The issue is that you need power at the site and they have a lot of complexity with them. They have gates that are moving every 20 minutes or an hour, um, 24 hours a day that need sensors of upstream and downstream water levels. They have valves, they have PLC codes, um, and there's errors that happen with that that shut it down for no good reason. And so despite the fact that we know when they're working that they work great, we have five lock fishways in New South Wales and none of them are working. And and so that's, that's an issue that, you know, we need your help as engineers because we know that they work biologically and a lot of times these should just be easy fixes. One of the main issues is um, a lot of the gates have a, a rising stem on them. Um, they, they put grease on it for obvious reasons, but this isn't a clean environment. So that grease collects a whole bunch of grit. You have a nut that goes up and down through this and that nut gets stripped very quickly and, and then they just seize up, the gate seize up. And given that there's oftentimes two, three, four, five gates at each one of these locks, they're seizing up all the time and these cost a fair amount of money for the asset owner to replace. So at Water New South, uh, sorry, SA Water, what they did is they put a jet around it to keep it clean and that seems to have fixed um, these rising spindle issues. But one of the other things we want to try doing is rather than using these rising spindles, try going to hydraulics and using that instead. I'm not going to really talk about the neo fishways because I, I personally don't like them very much. Um, they have their, their, their place, but I think there's other fishways that can perform better. There's a lot of issues biologically. Um, another issue is that debris is, this is one of the fishways that debris is the biggest issue probably. Um, if you get any debris in it, the, the fish wave pretty much stops working. Another thing is vandalism. Um, here's the baffle being pulled out by a colleague of mine, but what often happens is people actually do pull out the baffles, and that ruins the hydraulics of the denial, and they don't work. Oftentimes it's fishermen that pull them out, um, because the fish waves are ruining their best fishing spot. Um, uh, Pretty close to the end now. A major issue for us is cost of fishways. 
you saw that, that uh, map of all the barriers out there, and we'd like to get fishways at all of them. When I first started um, in 2004, there was a figure of about 150,000 per vertical meter is how much a fishway costs, and it was just a generic figure. I don't think that was ever really accurate except for rock ramp fishways. Um, this fishway in 2008 we put, this is Bertundi Weir, we put a vertical slot fishway and built it for 45000 um, So, you know, it's pretty reasonable cost um, for, for uh, a vertical slot fishway. Building a fishway now would cost, of that same type, would be about $1.2 million per vertical meter. Alright, so the costs have really gone up. And that means that it's really difficult when a fishway is a site is costing us anywhere from three to five to six million dollars. It really constrains where we can build these fishways at. And so over the last few years, we've really been trying to work, especially with Water New South Wales, is how can we try to identify places where we can save costs? So we can change the material. So instead of concrete, we can use sheet pile. You compromise on design life, but you significantly reduce the cost of the, the, um, the material that you're using. You can reduce contractor risk. So here, this whole fishway was built on a side channel, so it was built in a dry environment. So that contractor had virtually no risk of a flood. Or you can try building it more into the bank rather than in the, the river. The contractors hate risk. Risk will drive up the cost of the projects. The procurement process, is it an opener, is it a closed tender, or how they actually manage it can affect it. We've also been doing a lot of work with design optimization. Um, of where, and, and Martin talked about that with the slots, so I won't go into it. Um, prefabrication and um, novel designs, I'm just going to touch on that briefly. So this is a design that was developed over in um, uh, Austria. It's a prefabricated fishway. It's very similar to a vertical slot in design, but they prefabricated it and they built um, 50 of these over the last three years um, because they can just pull them in and drop them in and, and construct them. We don't have a, a prefabricated vertical slot or design like this over here. Now, there's some places where it's not feasible to do that, but it's something to look into. Um, I'm not sure if you ever heard of the salmon cannon. Um, this was developed over in the States. Um, in the fish pass community, videos of these came out a few years ago, and we all chuckled about it, and oh, that's funny. And I've actually visited them, and look, it's similar to John's um, a fish pump in the concept of it. And after visiting them and, and, and the cost of it, I think it's worth having a really good go at it. Because what happens is the fish on the right bottom right hand figure here comes into the fishway. It goes through a sampler that takes 19 photos of it. Um, that identifies whether it's a trout or a salmon or a pest species and can split it off in an instant. And then it sends it through these, these um, sleeves up over the, the barrier. This is Clay Elm Dam. It's a 60 meter high dam. Um, uh, John, I think, mentioned how much um, Talawa Dam cost to put a lift fishway there, 40 some million dollars. This costs them $2 million and takes them 60 seconds to um, shoot the, the fish over the structure. And that's, the, that's just their initial trial one. So when they actually would get up to production, you'd imagine that cost would come down. The other nice thing about this one and John's one is that once they enter in the fishway, once they get into that sleeve, it's a 100% success rate of fish getting up over. Where in a vertical slot, they may enter and get up halfway through and go, oh, I don't like this, and turn around. And so you don't get a 100% success rate. Here, it's 100% that they go up. But there's still, there's moving parts with this. It's never not been tested over here in Australia where our fish go. You can't actually use this on small, small body fish. That's another limitation. It has to be over 150, 200 mils in size. So that's a consideration as well. I'm going to end up today talking about um, uh, a task force that the minister set up. Fishways are expensive. Um, there's a lot of barriers out there. Uh, he wanted us to get more the department and, and the fish pest community to get a bit more um, coordinated of how we're actually addressing fishways. The reason for this is this is what we've built over the last 20 years. The blue highlights um, the main stem rivers that have been opened up because of these fishways. 
And Section 218 is a great legislative vehicle to be able to get asset owners to build fishways, but it's not coordinated. It's opportunistic. It's when they're doing refurbishment works. And so what we get is we get a hodgepodge of sites that aren't connected together. And, and just to put this in a, in a somewhat hypothetical but real life example, this is the Murrumbidgee River. You got two large dams at the top. And say you start off with Yanko where you put a fishway at that site in 2020, and then about Reynolds in 2025, and you think, wow, that's great. But it's, you really want to be achieving catchment river-wide fish passage for fish to migrate. You got Golgedry here in Red Bank, um, and, and right now, because of all the fishways in, um, in the Murray, we got free fish passage in the Murray and the Edward River, but they're not able to take advantage of getting into the Murrumbidgee until 2050 and 2060, 40 years after the first fishway has been built, because of the reactive nature that Section 218 is applied. And what we're proposing for the next 20 years is to take a strategic approach. And rather than doing it piecemeal, we've identified that on the main stem rivers below the, the, the large storage dams, there's only 160 barriers. That's it. And so our proposal is to deal with those 160 structures. And with that, instead of having those little snippets of blue around the place, we'll be able to provide connectivity all the way up and down our major river systems. Um, that's what I was talking about there. One of the key things that we want to achieve with the, um, the task force and the strategy that we develop is to optimize the cost effectiveness of fishways because the more expensive they are, the less that we can do. And that's really where we need the engineers to come in and work with the biologists and get those cost-effective designs. I'm just going to end with the fact that um, uh, I'm co-chairing a conference at the end of this year in Albury. It's the International Fish Passage Conference. Uh, it's the first time it's ever been in Australia. It's the first time it's ever been in the Southern Hemisphere. It probably won't be here again for another 15, 20 years. If you're interested in this, it's going to be in Albury. Um, I highly recommend that you come. Uh, you just listen. Uh, I don't want to you know, not have you come because one of the keynote speakers, Marn, has, uh, is, um, you know, our, you've already heard him. But um, it's a great opportunity to hear all these wonderful things that are happening around the world. Um, and it, it's, I find it quite an applied and, and useful conference. So if you have any questions about that, that's the conference website, the fish passage at uh, umass.edu. Um, otherwise, happy for you to contact me if you have any questions. <laughs>